So pleased to share with you, we have Dr. Han and Dr. Malvika for engaging discussions on the important topic, very relevant to Indian agriculture. Uh, Dr. Han is agri-research professional, a plant breeder and a research leader with the extensive global experience in building and leading highly successful plant breeding research teams, both in private and public sectors around the world. He spent 40 years of his professional career in various capacities, working in commercial plant breeding, more particularly the seed industry. And Dr. Hans is currently serving as a leader of a global rice breeding program of one CGIAR across International Research Institute, Africa Rice, CIAT, and he has been heading Rice Breeding Innovation Department at International Rice Research Institute since January 2019. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Hans. Uh, we also we have Dr. Malvika Dandani, former Joint Director, Research at Indi uh, Indian Re Agriculture Research Institute, ICER, New Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Malvika Dandani. The new seed technology imperative to Indian agriculture outcome is, is uh, the objective of this episode is to look at the new technologies, which has become a crucial focal point and to improve the aggregarian outcome amidst these persistent challenges. The new seed technology like genomic selection, gene editing, seed breeding to enhance the genetic gain, quicker delivery of high yielding and high quality hybrid seeds. The seed applied technology integrating with the biologicals to help farmer produce with the fewer resources and crop tolerant to pest and disease. And also making uh, adaptive, ad adapting to the climatic uh, changes. These technologies have the potential to boost crop yield, increase income for farmers, thereby en enhancing India food security for <clears throat> the growing population and ensure sustainable, sustainable food production. Uh, my first uh, question to both the esteemed panelists, what are the seed technologies in Indian agriculture and why do we need it? So, Dr. Hans, you would like to go first? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Ram Kumar, um, for your kind words and uh, nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to really participate in this uh, podcast discussion along with the Dr. Malvika Dadalani. Uh, regarding your question, uh, before I answer that specifically, let me first uh, uh, referred to some of the developments uh, or significant um, breakthroughs uh, which really helped uh, Indian agriculture um, uh, transform. And uh, if, if uh, I, I can myself um, speak to some of those uh, which I have seen myself, I have read about them uh, when I was a student during 1970s. And later on, when I uh, started practicing uh, plant breeding, uh, I experienced some of those uh, personally. <laughs> uh, and I think the number one uh, which comes to my mind uh, is, I mean, and uh, I'm sure all of you and a uh, lot of uh, agricultural scientists and researchers, and even the farmers are familiar with that, uh, would be the development and adoption of uh, dwarf and uh, input responsive uh, uh, cultivars, particularly in wheat and rice. Uh, uh, and I think uh, you can all relate to that, um, what is um, uh, known as green revolution. <laughs> and uh, that really turned India from uh, uh, what you call the, 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 the begging ball into a, a food basket in, 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 uh, in, in words of uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan. That's how he described um, when the green revolution took place and it really uh, helped transform the uh, Indian um, uh, agriculture and uh, made India as a, as a secured nation as far as the food was concerned. <laughs> and as we all know, India today is uh, not only self-sufficient in food production, but is also a 
net exporter of food to many of the countries. And actually, it is becoming a, a large uh, uh, revenue earner for uh, uh, for the country, which is I think we should all take pride in and uh, also thank uh, the visionary scientists and the leaders that time who really thought of that and uh, made it a reality. <clears throat> and uh, I would also like to uh, recognize and uh, acknowledge uh, the role uh, which was played not only by the, the researchers or the breeders, but also by the uh, agencies which really helped produce the seed of those um, uh, new cultivars and made it available to the farmers. And uh, some of the names which come to my mind, and uh, I'm sure you're all aware of those again, like National Seeds Corporation uh, at the federal level, and then uh, these many of the state seed uh, agencies like uh, Thrive Development Corporation in Uttar Pradesh, they played a very, very significant role uh, in um, multiplying those varieties uh, and uh, making that seed uh, uh, in enough quantities and making it available to the farmers. And uh, I think that really made a huge, huge difference in uh, uh, what the Indian agriculture looks like today. <laughs> And um, we should, like I said, uh, should be all feeling proud of that. Uh, the the second uh, uh, big breakthrough, which uh, I can relate to very well, is the what we call in technical term exploitation of uh, heterosis or hybrid vigor in major food crops, uh, such as uh, palm millet, sorghum, and maize. And again, this happened in 1970s uh, or around that time. Uh, uh, but this technology, or lots of discovery, research in developing the functional and uh, uh, reliable male sterility systems, it really led to the development of uh, hybrid varieties in uh, some of those crops. And uh, that was again uh, a big booster in terms of the, the productivity, uh, went up uh, significantly from the, from the standard varieties. And uh, I think many of the uh, state agricultural universities and the ICR institutes, uh, they played a very significant role in uh, developing that uh, male, male sterility system, <coughs> and uh, uh, which could be used uh, by a number of um, private seed companies. They came in and they really took advantage of that, those uh, discoveries and developments, and developed what we call today as a hybrid seed industry in the country. And uh, I happened to be part of that um, uh, for, for many, many years, right from the beginning. And um, I think, again, uh, that really made a huge, huge difference uh, along with the, uh, what we call those um, green revolution varieties uh, in uh, wheat and rice. So in some of these um, uh, uh, outcrossed uh, uh, crops, uh, the the advent of uh, hybrids using the male solidity system was a huge thing. And a uh, lot of uh, national as well as multinational seed companies came in and they really created or established uh, uh, the hybrid seed industry in the country, which is uh, again has grown um, very well and uh, is, is very, very strong today. And Kurteva and many other companies are uh, uh, part of that industry. So, uh, and some of the new developments like um, uh, the hybrid varieties in uh, brassica agencia or what you call indian mustard is uh, is another big um, uh, breakthrough which is relatively uh, recent compared to the other crops i mentioned earlier and similarly in, in rice the hybrid rice uh, varieties uh, are again making a significant contribution to the overall uh, uh, food production in the country <laughs> Uh, so I think that is that to my mind or in my assessment is the is the is the is the second uh, is not second is actually almost equally important as uh, the, the 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 those uh, dwarf and input responsive varieties which led to the green revolution in uh, 70s uh, or around that time. So I think th th these two things um, made a huge difference. I'll say or contributed a lot. The third thing which comes to my mind is uh, also the development of um, uh, multiple stress tolerant varieties. They could be biotic, they could be abiotic. Uh, uh, and that has been, I think, uh, uh, a very significant development. Uh, even though it didn't get noticed 
that uh, big as uh, the green revolution and the uh, introduction of uh, hybrid crop varieties in some of those other crops. But this really helped uh, what we call stabilizing that yield potential of these um, uh, green revolution varieties or hybrid crops. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this is uh, uh, really what we call today is kind of uh, addressing the climate change or the environment challenges uh, which uh, uh, we are all experiencing today. And uh, some of those varieties uh, with those uh, multiple um, uh, stress tolerances uh, are uh, a, a great uh, help in addressing those things. Uh, and a lot of work is going on uh, in, 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 in that space uh, uh, through the not only through the conventional plant breeding, but also some of the newer uh, techniques, breeding tools, uh, and the technologies which has come up. Uh, they they're going to make that job, I'll say, much more precise and much more faster. Uh, and uh, some of the technologies you already mentioned in your um, opening comments, uh, like gene editing, um, uh, which is I think very well known. You can have a very targeted, very precise, uh, which particular gene or which particular trait you want to manipulate uh, and um, improve. So some of these technologies are going to be very, very helpful. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Hans. You you covered the whole journey of a uh, uh, couple of waves, uh, the green revolution, the hybrid coming in, and then stabilizing the, the yield through traits. And you rightly mentioned that Sometime, uh, you know, it has not. It, it is. It has been taken always along with the hybrid. So, uh, 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 Dr. Malvika uh, would like to have your perspective uh, on the new technologies uh, in, in in Indian agriculture. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Dr. Hans has uh, very rightly uh, talked about the journey of Indian agriculture as he has uh, mentioned about what uh, Professor Swaminathan always says, that India uh, has, uh, uh, it has traveled a long path from its uh, begging bowl to becoming the one of the most food secure countries today, also an exporter. And it has happened because of two, I feel the two things which, has con which have contributed mainly Definitely the technology. Uh, initially, as he has rightly said, the breeding technologies, bringing high yielding varieties, better performing varieties, uh, better performing under a wide range of conditions, maybe a stress condition also. Uh, that had been the main contributor, no doubt. Then uh, we saw the uh, introduction of hybrids which changed the whole scenario. With the introduction of hybrids also was the time when the private sector, seed sector also uh, got a strong foothold in India. And uh, then the third thing which happened was uh, the new policy of seed development, which came in 1988, which uh, opened the entry of very many new varieties because the import policy was uh, liberalized. Uh, this was also then supported. Uh, next was the introduction of uh, uh, Plant Variety Protection Act, PPVFR Act in 2001, which also was the mark of bringing in the uh, BT technology or GM technology in India, which has a huge impact. There is no denying the fact. However, in the present day, when there are uh, some kind of, as far as the GM technology goes, the next best technological advance, that is the gene editing technology, which uh, Dr. Hans has rightly pointed out, in 2022, the new guidelines which has permitted the gene editing in uh, in plant uh, varieties is a very promising thing to happen. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is, it is always a combination of good technology supported by an enabling policy. Without that, the progress cannot happen. Now, in this, uh, uh, in the present times, 
Another thing which has uh, come up uh, as a very promising technology are the applied technologies. As we normally use the term, one is the genotypic advancements and the other is applied advancement, which are the two complementary things. When you know that, uh, uh, suppose you have a very good material, a very good hybrid, which performs very well under moisture stress condition or which has a very good uh, resistance against uh, the major disease, whichever is in that crop, but is susceptible to high temperature at the time of, uh, say, germination or initial uh, plant establishment, then one can actually today, one can go for a combination of an applied technology that may be through a seed coating along with the nutrients, along with the cultures, microbial cultures or biologicals or other growth stimulants. There is enormous potential. I mean, it is endless. And with a combination of these two, one can achieve much more at a much less cost, I would say. Because actually uh, there is a wrong perception that farmers do not uh, want to uh, use hybrids because they have to purchase it every year. No. Once the, they understand the advantages in terms of yield, in terms of its adaptability, they don't mind uh, uh, investing that much extra. And actually the cost of seed works out less than 10%. It is actually ranges between 3 to 6% in most of the crops. And uh, which is uh, very negligible in terms of the total cost of production. And there, even if they have to pay slightly more, say in, in, in place of 5%, even it is 5.5% because of the added technologies, the farmers don't mind that because the advantages are so much more. It yeah. gives a initial boost. It gives a very uh, a good uh, root system, very intensive root network, which enables the plant or the seedling to survive against many stresses. That stress may be biological against pathogens or insects, or that may be abiotic. That is maybe for uh, temperature or moisture deficit or, or any other uh, salinity or any other. So this technology is a, a very powerful technology, very potential technology, and a combination of genetic advancement using the modern genetic tools, molecular tools, as per the regulatory, uh, as per the regulations, and combined with the seed technologies, applied seed technologies, can actually, uh, it will go a long way in the, in the coming years. That's what I feel. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Malvika. In fact, uh, you rightly mentioned on the, uh, the, the recent development uh, happening on, on the uh, regulatory framework coming for uh, gene editing with SCN1, SCN2, uh, it's, it's possible to uh, do more and more this uh, has a potential to spread this technology. Uh, yeah. would like to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, know more from Dr. Hans on what are those current exciting development in uh, uh, which is happening in this GUC technology and how the, the future outlook looks you know, uh, from perspective of five to ten years timeline. Uh, well, I think there is. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I think the the options and uh, opportunities are enormous now compared to what it used to be in the 60s or 70s. Uh, the, the choices in terms of uh, the approaches or the tools uh, available to the breeders or researchers were very limited, uh, but now I think. Um, with uh, strong investments both by the public and the private sector uh, in uh, uh, developing these new tools and technologies uh, which can uh, help uh, uh, very precisely uh, kind of a, uh, a target uh, certain traits which we want to improve upon. 
uh, I think those things are possible now. And uh, there are numerous technologies. I mean, we're talking about the, uh, the, the gene editing is, is just one. There are many other which are complementary to this, like uh, I'm sure you have heard of uh, speed breeding, right? How fast you can breed, right? That itself is a huge, um, uh, uh, brings a lot of value that how, how quickly you can um, uh, increase the rate of genetic gain um, per cycle or per year. Uh, then the precision phenotyping, you know, that's another important um, uh, uh, a, a kind of a development. Uh, in the old days, the only option was you go to a spot, what we used to call them as hot spots, where the disease or the pest occurs naturally. But now you can create a lot of these things under what we call them as kind of stress management environments. You can artificially create those, right? And uh, then uh, there are a lot of technologies into the hybrid seed production, like different male sterility options, right? Uh, in those days, the only option was, um, or the beginning was what you call cytoplasmic male sterility. Nowadays, there are many ways you can um, make a plant uh, sterile and uh, still uh, economically produce uh, hybrid seed using those. <laughs> Uh, then um, efficient water and nutrient uh, usage um, uh, technologies. You know, a lot of things you can um, either through gene editing or other means, uh, we have a much better understanding how the nutrient uptake really works uh, into, into, the, uh, into the plant system from the soils. Uh, the seed dressing and uh, numerous uh, treatments, you know, whether they are insect or other um, um, uh, fungicides which you can put on the seed, you know, uh, they, they also make a huge difference. So the, 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 the biologicals is another one uh, which is a most recent development, you know, and good thing is uh, all these technologies, uh, if they are genetic technologies, they could be embedded into the seed or if they are um, like a seed dressing or seed treatments or some of the other biologicals, they can be put on the seed. So you can package everything in or on the seed, right? And uh, this makes it um, uh, so complete and comprehensive, uh, not only for the farmers that he's getting a complete package, what he really needs. He doesn't need to keep hunting for bits and pieces. I need this from here, I need this from there. No, everything is coming into that seed. And it also is a huge incentive or a, a business opportunity for a lot of uh, uh, seed and chemical companies, right? So I think it's, it's, it's a good fit. Uh, so some of these technologies are really making these uh, as a as a, a new realities, which was not possible a few years ago to even uh, think of these things, right? Now it is possible. So so I think uh, in, in my view, in the next few years, if you do these things right, package them well, the genetic technologies uh, and along with these other uh, seed treatment, seed dressing and other things, uh, this is what is going to lead to the next green revolution. Right. Uh, provided, of course, we need to have a strong seed system in place so that we can get these seeds uh, in time, in the right condition, <laughs> to the right farmers and to the right regions. Uh, and that's uh, another whole uh, new area, you know, where uh, the country need to uh, still do some more work, but it's doable. It's not that it can't be done. Uh, there could be policy elements on that. Uh, there could be some other incentives. Uh, and uh, also there's a need for a leadership that someone need to drive it. And uh, I'm reminded of, uh, I'm sure some of you can relate to that, uh, when these um, uh, Mexican wheat varieties were introduced in India uh, in um, late 60s and early 70s, uh, uh, they were decisions made at the political level. They imported some thousands of metric tons of seed, right? And made it available to as many farmers as quickly as possible and multiplied. And then within a couple of years, you will find all those varieties were growing um, all over the country. And that is something which need to happen uh, now also. And I, I can, uh, I, I get to see and the, how the system works in the country today. Sometimes the varieties, very promising, they get released, they get notified, but it, some of them, they never get to see the day of the light. They never make to the farmer's field. They just sit either with the researchers or the research institute or get published in the gadget and that's it. 
So I think there's a huge opportunity to someone uh, to take a lead on that, how we can get that um, genetics or new technologies to the farmers as quickly as possible. That's what's going to make a, a huge impact. You know, yeah. otherwise a lot of these things could go waste. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, continue further what uh, sure. Dr. Hans just mentioned about the new varieties which are developed by mostly the research institutions or the public sector research institutions. Now there is a very uh, positive trend which has happened in the last 10, 15 years, I would rather say. And uh, 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 I, I know that uh, uh, many, uh, IRI has a, a signed, uh, like I mean, a contract or agreement with a number of private seed companies from MNCs to the Indian companies and even the open pollinated varieties of wheat and rice and other crops, even vegetables, have been given to the private sector. And thanks to it, the, uh, these seeds have actually reached farmers at a much faster pace and across the country. Uh, in fact, it is very heartening. It's very uh, good to uh, point out that the seed replacement rate and varietal replacement rate, which was pretty low, even say 15, 20 years back, when uh, it was estimated that more than 60% seeds that the farmers use are farm saved seeds. From there, today it is almost less than 40% that, that also in remote areas. And the varietal replacement as well as seed replacement rates have gone up considerably in most of the crops, leaving a few, of course. So what I'm trying to say is that this kind of partnerships are the way forward, which has to happen, which is already happening. And uh, there is a lot of support also from the government. There had been certain changes brought in. Actually, whenever there is a good technology, then uh, 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 with the scientific uh, support, there is always a policy change as well. We have seen that happening in the, in the past. Sure. Even in the, in the very recent past, I will give one example. For example, the biostimulants, which uh, are very effective in for seed treatments. These were not covered uh, under either, I mean, because these were not covered in the fertilizers. These were not covered under the biopesticides. So there was a huge problem. I mean, how to market it, how to import or how to uh, market. So in 2021-22, the, the Fertilizer uh, Act, I mean, the, uh, the rule was modified and a change was made to include biostimulants. So this is how it happens, you know, step by step. And with that happening, uh, as Dr. Hans rightly said, because seed treatments not only for uh, not only for uh, uh, seed treatment against diseases and pests but also for example uh, even for disease and then pests because when you treat the seed you are actually uh, minimizing the use of pesticide which has a, a very big significance in terms of environment sure. the dusting off of pesticide is minimized so it is good for the health of the users, for the farmers. They are, their health is not being adversely affected. So you are reducing, actually you are reducing the uh, quantity of pesticide used and therefore cost also is reduced significantly. More importantly, it is uh, very important from environment security as well as for human being health, safety of the human beings. So with these also uh, in mind, I think a good genetics and good applied technology is going to be the normal way of uh, uh, doing seed business. And considering that Indian seed sector is one of the very strong ones, where both private and public sectors play an equal role. In fact, uh, some uh, studies have shown that they are almost at par equal contributions. In terms of value, the private sector is even higher. So given that, uh, where Indian uh, seed sector is estimated at 
anywhere between four to six billion US dollars annually. It is a very strong seed sector sure. and it has huge potential not only for domestic market, but also for export market, for global market. Yeah. Well said. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Malvika. In fact, uh, one thing which was echoed is, uh, you know, uh, having a, a technology like gene editing and also integrating the smaller technologies together and have and having a delivery mechanism to reach out to the to the larger uh, Indian farmer. Uh, uh, my next question to Dr. Hans: uh, You have you have witnessed the trends over the decades uh, in adoption of multiple seed technologies, starting as a corn breeder. Uh, I understand you you had opportunity to work in Bihar, some of the remotest place, and guiding researchers on 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 different crops. So we would like to hear from uh, from your experience. Well, <laughs> Ramo, that's a uh, very interesting um, question, and um, but at the same time, it's very hard to describe and capture all that those experiences uh, of uh, over uh, four decades. But I can relate to some of the things which I think are at least uh, I always carry that um, in my heart. And uh, I always um, uh, promote or propagate uh, those values um, uh, with the young researchers. Uh, one of the things which I learned in Bihar, and that was in um, uh, early 1980s, I I was uh, living and working in uh, in Samastipur area. In uh, if you guys uh, know that, <laughs> and uh, those days uh, the the kind of the infrastructure, the facilities, and in general, uh, the living conditions um, uh, were really very, very difficult, very challenging. But you believe it or not, but every small or medium and big farmer, I, I mean, that's all relative terms, they all used to go and buy hybrid corn seed. Many of them, I've seen witnesses by with my own eyes. They used to come to our farm, look at the demo plots and all that. Many of them, they didn't have enough clothing on their body, but they'll go to a seed dealer, buy the hybrid seed, which used to be that time seven to ten rupees a kilogram. <laughs> I'm talking about that time, uh, but they'll buy that. <clears throat> and uh, I always used to ask that question: How come a farmer? who is so poor, but still goes and buys a hybrid seed and plants that. And I think uh, the answer came out very simply that the, the, those varieties and these uh, small seed companies in the area, including ours, we had a small research center, we used to uh, do the farmer's day, field day and all that. We were able to demonstrate the value the hybrid varieties had over the conventional varieties or the OPVs, right? And those farmers were able to see it so visibly. It was so evident. You don't need to really say anything else, right? So I think the, the key is as long as you can, uh, first of all, create value and demonstrate that value to the farmers or the consumers, there is there should be no issue with that, with the adoption of that technology. Many times we sometimes get bogged down by um, either the nature of the technology or nature of the product. We make it so complex and so uh, difficult for to even to demonstrate the value of uh, um, certain traits or technologies with that product carries. And it is it's, th that's really the key there, you know. And uh, if you can simplify it and present a whole product rather than, uh, you know, we used to have a saying. Uh, that in in uh, in a hybrid seed business, you don't sell inbirds, you sell hybrids. And when you talk about um, the the trade focused breeding, I always tell people, guys, we don't sell a particular trait. We sell a product with a certain package of traits, and that's what we need to focus on while we are trying to demonstrate the value of that. And I think uh, that that's a very simple. Um, uh, formula and it works. It works everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter big farmer, small farmer. And uh, uh, so I think that that would be one of my 
key learnings which I like to share with the audience or with the young researchers, you know, they should keep it in mind. Uh, thanks, Dr. Han. Uh, I, I just echo, I think the similar is a hybrid rise story uh, uh, in, in places like Charkhand and Chhattisgarh, where really making difference uh, uh, in the livelihood of the farmers. Yes. Uh, 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 my next question to Dr. Malvika, uh, you know, seed applied technology has been your favorite. And how, how, how you have seen, uh, uh, you know, witness this, how it has impacted the, the Indian agriculture? Could you share a couple of experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, uh, there is often uh, some kind of uh, uh, doubts or I would say uh, in, in the private sector, they always feel sometimes, they question also us, that uh, the Indian Plant Variety Protection Law, PPVFR Act, is the first now, of course, some more uh, countries are also following similar pattern, which allows a farmer to uh, use, to re to share, and also seeds of a protected variety, which to sell, giving that right to the farmer is not given anywhere because everywhere it is a farmer's privilege. In Indian Act, it is farmer's rights, considering that a huge, almost 80% of our farmers are smallholders. Now, there are, there are two things we have to keep in mind. Yes, they are smallholder farmers. They must be given the right to use their own produce, whether they want to share, they want to sell, whatever they want to do. Now, the private sector sometimes feel that we are uh, investing so much in R&D but in developing new varieties with uh, very, very improved traits, then once it goes to the farmer, if he is given all the rights to uh, multiply, to re to sell, to sell or to share, then how can we make profits? So in case of OPV, as I said, that for one wheat variety, there were more than 200 uh, IRI signed more than 200 licenses with different seed companies from small to big to MNCs. And the farmers will still buy a better company variety knowing that the seed quality will be much better right. than coming from some small uh, company or which is not that uh, highly reputed. So there is a big scope for uh, applied technologies. Now, when open pollinated variety of rice, for example, or wheat, for example, uh, may be uh, sold by uh, the, any state seed corporation or a small seed company, and also a very reputed company, which makes sure about the quality of the seed that they sell. That quality, not only through grading and processing, but also through some applied technologies. Now, the farmer, once he knows that this gives me a 100% assurance where almost every seed performs well, will definitely go and buy that because it reduces his cost of seed. The seed rate is lowered significantly and the farmer knows the best. Once he uses a good material, as Dr. Hans has rightly said, it is a product, it's a whole package. It's not just genetics, it's a whole package. And the farmer, you must gain farmer's uh, trust that this works, this gives me better returns. And if you have done that, then definitely the farmer will come back for your product even if that variety is available at 30%, 40%, or 50% less price by some other agency. So this is where you will have to make sure that your seed gives something more than what others are giving. That you can do by way of uh, many of the seed companies, therefore, are investing a lot on the R&D, on applied technologies as well. They also buy, I mean, there are proprietary technologies 
which are the standalone companies which only specialize on these. And that uh, technology can be uh, bought by anyone, I mean, licensed. But many seed companies are also now having a wing, an R&D wing, only for seed applied technologies. Sure. And where we all know the biologicals are playing, going to play a very big role, it is already in, uh, in the market. There are already many very good uh, seed treatments. I would not like to take any names for the simple reason that I shouldn't be. But there are really very good uh, technologies are already in the market, even in India, it is already in the market. Sure. And the farmers who are aware of that will always go for that. But only one uh, small little uh, regulatory change will have to be brought in, I feel, because uh, as per our uh, seed law, which actually, again, uh, the the new seed bill is pending for now too much, too long. So uh, the coated seeds are still not included under certified seed. So any kind of coating, pelleting or coating, is uh, uh, cannot be seed, cannot be certified. That is one uh, drawback. So you will find that most of these kind of technologies are being used in vegetables where in any case, uh, most of the seed goes under TL or truthfully labeled seed. And, uh, but in some cases, it has tremendous potential. For example, even in corn, uh, it has a tremendous potential. In cotton, we have seen uh, the gaucho treated uh, cotton seeds perform so much better. In soybean, we have seen thiomethoxin uh, treated seeds perform so much better. And, uh, it is not just coating with a with a pesticide or with an insecticide. It is a coating with a whole package of things. A pesticide along with some nutrients, along with some microbial inoculum, which yeah. gives a whole package, which gives a whole product. And when the uh, your product is good, as Dr. Han said that about uh, hybrid corn, he talked about Bihar uh, experience. Let's take a crops like. Uh, uh, pearl millet and sorghum, which are the crops of the dry lands, uh, low rainfed area, poorest of the poor farmers. There you you find all the hybrids, all the farmers are using are hybrids, 80 to 90 percent, it's hybrids. So that shows that if your product is good, farmers know, they know that, uh, uh, I mean, where I should invest. And as I said, cost of the seed, no matter how much uh, you have uh, invested is not really that much. It will still be not more than six to seven percent. So farmers understand that their return on that investment is much, much more, much, much more, better than any other input. The advantage that one gets through seeds is much higher than any other input. And that's where the strength of the seed sector lies. That's sure. what I think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malvika. You, you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the farmer sees the value first uh, and how much it makes a difference uh, uh, in, in, you know, uh, in increasing the income of, uh, you know, from the crop he grows. You know, we listed uh, uh, many uh, in our disc the discussion points, the technologies. And uh, what do you see, uh, you know, the top challenges in the adoption of the seed technology uh, and what are the role of different stakeholders you rightly mentioned you know uh, the, reg the regulatory authority uh, you know the seed companies uh, uh, so to to harness the full potential you know of technology like gene editing so so i think um, uh, some of the uh, challenges uh, uh, Dr. Malavika already mentioned actually, uh, and uh, they could range from uh, how do you really demonstrate the value to the uh, farmer or to the consumers, uh, going all the way to the some of the policy uh, uh, matters, you know, which are also very important, which are enabling uh, policies uh, that need to be there in place. Uh, but I think to me, the the biggest challenge today, as I see, is um, and it, it doesn't. 
it, it, when I'm talking about a new technology, it could be a new variety in itself. You know, it doesn't need to be necessarily a new biological discovery or new um, uh, chemical uh, insecticide or herbicide. It could be anything. So, so, so I think uh, the given the fact that uh, majority of our farmers, first of all, they are uh, small holding farmers. You know, they have their own limitations, their constraints. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the 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 current generation of farmers. I'm not talking about the younger uh, generation. They are much more uh, tech savvy. They are much more informed, and uh, they know. But the the current generation of farmers, uh, I think they still don't have that level of uh, awareness. And the technology uh, providers need to take that responsibility. You know, unlike in some of the developing world, you go, the farmers are so uh, up to date with things, you know, and they're so tech savvy and they have um, the, the media uh, access and everything, right? Uh, and even though India is getting much, much better, much faster, but still the, the lot of people in the rural areas who are currently doing the farming, they don't have that. Uh, so I think the, the technology providers, whether it's a seed company or a chemical company, they need to take that responsibility. We need to go there and educate farmers, inform them, demonstrate the value of those technologies. So that would be, I think, uh, number one thing which um, uh, we need to be thinking about. The second part is, I think, again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this relates to the uh, the future generation of farmers. You know, this is um, in some countries, uh, uh, like particularly in the US and even in Europe or Latin America, the younger generation, they don't want to go into farming, right? And um, they want to do something uh, which is easy or uh, kind of a more uh, white collar or blue collar. Uh, and a lot of younger generation, they don't want to uh, get into farming business and uh, farming operations. And I think uh, same is almost going to be true in, in India as well. The young generation, they are, like I said, better informed, better educated. They're looking for opportunities in the cities or other um, uh, businesses other than the agriculture. So we need to be thinking about how do we really uh, uh, kind of motivate these people or encourage these people that some of them need to stay in agriculture business or in farming business or farming operations. Otherwise, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, the Our current generation are getting older and older. Uh, they, uh, there's only that much they can do uh, and handle. So the young generation has to be again uh, um, encouraged, motivated. They need to be educated right from the beginning. And again, the technology providers, um, uh, along with the help from the government uh, or the public sector, um, whether this is a policy framework or other or other incentives, they need to be given to the younger generation so they get attracted or motivated to stay in farming or at least. Uh, um, if they are two sons or three sons or two children, at least one of them <laughs> stays in the farming business. Otherwise, it's going to be really a challenge, you know, going forward. So that's another thing which I see as a barrier. Uh, and, and I think we need to invest into that. First of all, we need to be aware of this. And then uh, we, both the technology for, uh, providers and the government need to invest into that to make sure that the young generation really is, is excited about the opportunities in farming operations. I think uh, Dr. Hans has very uh, nicely, he has summed it up. I just want to add that uh, uh, the government of India is also aware because the situation is the same, as you have pointed out, Dr. Hans, is almost the same in India. At least in some states, it is very much uh, evident that the younger generation, they just don't want to uh, get into the agriculture as their profession. Uh, only in those areas where the farmers are too poor or too small holders, where they have no other option oh. and the children are not yet educated, then they remain uh, engaged in agriculture. The moment they get educated and they have any better opportunity, they don't want to stay uh, uh, in agriculture as their profession. So. Uh, uh, government program, which is known as ARIA, 
on attracting rural youth in agriculture. That has been started uh, almost, uh, I think, 10 years or something, uh, uh, which has the, this as their main objective, how to uh, attract and how to retain uh, the youth in agriculture, making it profitable. That's the main thing. They don't want to remain in agriculture because they don't find it uh, sufficiently remunerative, sufficiently profitable. So how to make it more profitable? And that's uh, where Dr. Hans has rightly said that all these things are for uh, better returns or better performance. When they know that uh, uh, you know everything is not uncertain and they don't know what they are going to really harvest, and once they harvest, whether there will be any market or not. So now there's a whole chain which has to be in place and some steps have already been taken and this kind of uh, initiatives have been started to link the farmers with the market and also to aggregate the smallholder farmers so that they can also mechanization is one thing which can make their farming much more profitable, but they can't do that because of their small land holdings. So one the, once these smallholders get uh, together or aggregate together, they and there are also now custom hiring centers so they can hire these machineries or implements and uh, that can definitely reduce the drudgery, uh, which is one thing that the youth uh, doesn't want to get into agriculture for. So that will reduce the drudgery, that will reduce the cost because the human labor is becoming uh, not only scarce, also uh, 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 very expensive. expensive, very expensive. So once this, these things, all these things have to be brought together, then only we can really make farming profitable and as the uh, government's uh, uh, aspiration to double their income, it can happen. It very much it can happen if we take it as a package, not one thing at a time. So I think it has a lot of promise and we can do it. We can do it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malvika uh, and Dr. Hans. This, this, this topic, which, uh, you know, as rightly mentioned, you know, it is, it is, uh, you know, all those who are involved in different stakeholders uh, involved and demonstration of technology is key. And, and rightly said, uh, uh, in case if the farm's income need to be double, which is also a government objective, uh, the adoption and integrating the multiple technologies, the technology becomes imperative. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hans. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malvika, for very informative, you know, discussions and and you know, coming from your your practical experience over the years, uh, you know, and and you know, enlightening us. Uh, we touched up various aspects of of this new technology, and what is coming up is integrating, you know, uh, uh, and a you know, and a right delivery mechanism to to uh, involving a different stakeholders to reach out to the farmers and and also creating interest among the youth if it is profitable there are, they would like to stay in agriculture uh, thank you for your time and you know engaging a discussions on a very important topic thank you dr hans and thank you dr malvika thank you thank you for inviting thank you. it was a pleasure thank you